All right, well, while I'm, I'm admitting people, I will also get started. Uh, I know a lot of you know me, but some of you may not. I am Lawrence Davis Hollander. I am the program coordinator for the Scoville Memorial Library. And uh, we're very pleased to have Richard Rothstein with us today. Uh, go back to him in a minute or two. Um, so this is a co-sponsored program with the Salisbury Historical Association and um, Multicultural Bridge. And um, I just wanted to tell you we have a our sort of last, well, it is our last upcoming program for the calendar year. Uh, this coming Saturday uh, should be of interest to a lot of the people who are here today. Um, which is going to be the uh, program about the Caesar family, noble African citizens of Northwest Connecticut, a black history mm. conversation. And this is uh, based, uh, it's a conversation between uh, Catherine Overton, uh, one of the Caesar family descendants. Uh, this was a family that was up until the 30s, had about five generations going back almost to the Revolutionary War in the Salisbury area. So very significant. So this will be a conversation between uh, Rowan McCriskey and Catherine Overton, the descendant, and um, should be very interesting. So that's at Saturday at five o'clock and you can find out about it on our website or get the link, what have you. Um, so I, I don't know if Maya and Stephanie are here for Multicultural Bridge, but if I just wanted to say, I see Maya right there. So if you just wanted to say something, um, Keep it short, but please do. Thank you. Um, so my name is Maya Richards. I'm the sustainable sustainability and justice coordinator for Bridge, um, Berkshire Resources for Integration of Diverse Groups through Education. Um, so we're um, based in the in Berkshire County in Lee, a couple of town towns over um, from our neighbors in Connecticut. Um, so we were founded in 2007. Um, and we're a minority and women run nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing equity and justice by promoting cultural competence, positive psychology, mutual understanding and acceptance. Um, so the organization has really acted as a catalyst for change through collaboration, education, training, dialogue, fellowship and advocacy. Um, we work to connect vulnerable community members with key resources and networks. Um, while also providing education to both local institutions and the community at large. Um, and we also offer private consultation, training, um, translation services, and other support for businesses looking to ensure equity in their workplaces. Um, 11 years ago, Bridge launched the Toward Racial Justice and Equity in the Berkshires campaign to mobilize education and advocacy around equity and social justice and to respond vigilantly to incidents of discrimination, um, bullying, gender bias, and generational poverty um, as they arise in coalitions, schools, and throughout the community. Um, so as a part of the campaign, we have two monthly meetings for community members to come together and identify tangible ways to create change and hold each other accountable to the commitments we make. Um, so this is actually one of those meetings, um, one of the times that we meet um, the first Thursday of each month. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Wright. I have been with Bridge for about nine years in the capacity as community engagement and facilitator. Race Task Force, that's the first Monday of each month. We meet from 12 to 2. We have been convening with community leaders since 2010 to make visible the racial disparities in our county. Meetings take place monthly with the delegates from public safety, legal system, education, health and human services, along with political representatives, educators and dedicated Berkshire County residents. The task force is a network of agencies across sectors that have committed to staying vigilant in communication and unified in action around racial disparities and racism in our county. Toward Racial Justice South, that's the meeting we're in tonight. TRJ, which is the first Thursday of the month, 6.30 to 9, was formed about five years ago. It is a sub-task force committed to cultural humility, self-education, accountability, and action and support to the Towards 
racial justice and equity in the Berkshires campaigns. We also hold TRJ monthly accountability meetings and every two months hold people of color, white caucus, men's caucus for racial justice meetings with Bridge and Berkshire Surge trained facilitators for community support and education on the intersections of identity and racial justice work. This month, we're bought with our December TRJ meeting to join the Salisbury Association Historical Society for an author discussion with Richard Rothstein on the color of law. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, there's not a lot of organizations like Bridge in our, in our general geography. So uh, if you're not familiar with them, they do some wonderful work. Um, I think Rich, Richard makes a great case for why we should know about history. And uh, if there's any question of there being systemic racism, uh, I think his research is ample proof. Uh, he is a former columnist for the New York Times and a research associate at the Economic Policy Institute, as well as a fellow of the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP, a uh, legal defense fund. And uh, I'm sure he's got a much longer resume, but uh, we'll leave it at that. And uh, we are really pleased to have him. Uh, there should be a little time for some questions. There's not going to be a lot of time for questions, uh, but um, we'll see what happens as we get to the end. And I will remind you to use the chat box if you've got questions and please keep yourselves muted. So with that, Richard Rothstein. Thank you very much, Lawrence. And uh, thanks, to, uh, Mary, Stephanie, and all of you who've uh, come here to engage with me in this uh, conversation. Um, uh, this evening. Uh, um, did I say Mary? I meant Maya. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sponsoring this. Um, as, uh, let me begin by uh, reminding all of us <clears throat> that, as, as you may know, I'm sure you do, in the 20th century we had a civil rights movement in this country. It began by challenging uh, racial segregation in law schools, then went on to challenge it in, in, in colleges and universities. And then in 1954, uh, won a uh, Supreme Court decision by law. And then that Brown versus Board of Education gave uh, inspiration to a movement of activists who engaged in marches and demonstrations and civil disobedience. Uh, people lost their lives in that struggle. Others were beaten seriously. Um, so it was not an easy thing to do. But by the end of the 1960s, that civil rights movement uh, persuaded much of the country, not everybody, but much of the country, that racial segregation was wrong, that it was immoral, that it was harmful both to African Americans and to whites, that it was incompatible with our self-conception as a democratic society. With that understanding uh, that, uh, and with very aggressive and militant tactics, the civil rights movement succeeded in ending segregation and public accommodations and restaurants and transportation and buses and trains and uh, public accommodations of all kinds, employment. And then in 1968, uh, we passed a uh, civil rights law, a Fair Housing Act in the wake of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And um, that act prohibited ongoing discrimination in the sale and rental of housing, but did not do anything retroactively to um, undo past discrimination. But the civil rights movement nonetheless um, ended and went home and left untouched this biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. Uh, I've lived in many of them. Every one that I've lived in had clearly defined areas that were either all white or mostly white, or clearly defined areas that were either all black or mostly black. Uh, how could it be if we understood that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, <clears throat> harmful to both African-Americans and whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a democratic society. How could we leave untouched the biggest segregation of all? Well, 
<clears throat> I guess you could say partly because it's hard to redress residential segregation. If we um, pass a law prohibiting segregation in restaurants, next day you sit anywhere you want in the restaurant. But if we pass a law prohibiting segregation of neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't look much different. And so what we've done, all of us, and I mean all of us, uh, blacks and whites, liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, Northerners, Southerners, what all of us have done is adopted a national rationalization, an excuse we give ourselves to, uh, for failing to uh, take action to end this biggest segregation of all, which is residential segregation, neighborhood segregation. Um, the excuse goes something like this. We tell ourselves that um, the segregation that we abolished in the 20th century of schools and colleges and restaurants and buses, uh, that was segregation that had been created by government, by law, by regulation, by public policy, by ordinance. If the federal government was doing it, it was a violation of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, the civil rights violation. And we understood that we have an obligation to remedy it. <clears throat> Excuse me, if state and local governments were doing it, it was a violation of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, also civil rights violation. And we understood that we had an obligation to remedy that. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves, that's something entirely different. We say that wasn't done by government, not by law, by regulation, uh, by uh, ordinance, and public policy. That just sort of happened naturally. It happened by accident. It happened maybe because um, uh, white homeowners and landlords bigoted, uh, refused to sell or rent a home to an African-American in their neighborhood. <clears throat> or maybe we tell ourselves it happened because um, private businesses like real estate agencies and banks and um, developers, insurance companies discriminated in how they carried out their purely private sector activities. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's because blacks and whites just like to live with each other the same race. We feel more comfortable that way. And that's why we have segregation. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's all because of income differences. Uh, on average, African-Americans have uh, smaller incomes than whites, lower incomes than whites. And so uh, many uh, African-Americans can't afford to purchase homes or rent homes in white neighborhoods. <clears throat> All of these individual, bigoted perhaps, but uh, non-governmental decisions, private sector activities, people's own choices, uh, economic differences, is what's created residential segregation. And we tell ourselves, if government wasn't involved, it happened by accident, it happened naturally, what happened by accident can only unhappen by accident, can only unhappen naturally. Most of us, I think, I assume if you came to this event this evening, most of us think it's too bad that we're residentially segregated. We live in an apartheid society, but we don't feel an obligation as American citizens to do anything to undo it. Well, um, we give a name to this myth, to this rationalization that we give it ourselves. We say that what we have is de facto segregation, a term we all use, uh, something that was created not by government, but by private activity. Well, um, uh, Lawrence mentioned that I was a, a columnist at the New York Times. I was the education columnist. I wrote a weekly column on education um, uh, and wrote many, many other articles for other publications about education policy. And in the 1990s and 2000s, I spent much of my uh, effort uh, criticizing the dominant educational policy that this country was following. The theory behind it was that uh, we had an achievement gap between black and white children, a serious problem. And the reason for that achievement gap, the fact that African-American children achieved at lower levels uh, than white middle-class children, uh, was that the uh, teachers had low expectations of black children. They just didn't try very hard. And if only we could force teachers to try harder, the achievement gap would disappear. I thought this was a pretty foolish theory. Um, I didn't think that the cause of the achievement gap was a teacher low expectations. Not that some teachers don't have low expectations, but I didn't think that was the cause of the achievement gap. But yet, <clears throat> that theory was embodied into federal law 
In 2001, we passed a law called the No Child Left Behind Act, whose residues are still with us today. That act required that children be tested every year for the first time. And um, we said if we can simply test all children every year and hold teachers accountable for their test scores, the uh, teachers will no longer uh, be able to uh, not try very hard with black children and the, test, and the achievement gap will disappear. That was our theory. As I said, I thought it was a ludicrous theory, but it was uh, the No Child Left Behind Act was adopted with that theory. Of course, it didn't succeed. Uh, the achievement gap is with us today uh, in to pretty much the same extent as it was in 2001 when the law was passed. The only thing that the No Child Left Behind Act accomplished was it gave schools an incentive to abandon a well-rounded curriculum and substitute uh, drills in math and reading instead in a fruitless effort to raise test scores. Nonetheless, um, uh, that's what we did. And I tried to explain in the writings I was doing that, uh, well, some teachers may have low expectations of minority children. Uh, that's not the reason we have an achievement gap. The reason we have an achievement gap is primarily because of the social and economic conditions that children bring to school that uh, create challenges for them in their ability to take advantage of what schools have to offer. So I wrote column after column about this. I'll give you one example. Um, I remember writing a column about asthma. <clears throat> As you may know, uh, low-income African-American children in urban neighborhoods have asthma at four times the rate in this country of middle-class children four times the rate, it's an enormous difference. And the reason they have asthma is because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, uh, more diesel trucks driving through, more dilapidated buildings, more vermin in the environment, more empty lots kicking up dust. And if a child has asthma, uh, that child is more likely, not necessarily, but more likely than a child without asthma to be up at night wheezing and then coming to school drowsy the next day. So if, a group of, so if you have a group of two, two groups of uh, identical children, same racial breakdown, same social and economic background, same family structure, same economic situation, but one group has a higher rate of asthma than the other, then that group is gonna come to school slightly drowsier than the, than the other group and have lower average achievement, not by a lot, but simply because of the asthma have lower average achievement. And um, uh, I tried to explain that the, uh, this is a, a part of the achievement gap, a very small part. But then when you begin to think of all the other conditions uh, that have similar contributions to low achievement, uh, lead poisoning, a measurable uh, uh, impact on IQ, homelessness, economic insecurity, you begin to add all these up and you pretty much explain the achievement gap. Uh, you leave a little bit left over for low expectations of teachers, but not much. So this is what I was thinking about. And then I, I realized that um, it's one thing if, I have a, if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity. It's another thing if you have a school where every child has either asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity or any one of a number of other social and economic challenges. Um, what happens in a school like that? How can a school like that ever be expected to achieve at the same level as a school where children come well-rested, uh, uh, well-nourished in economically secure homes? Uh, of course, you, um, you can't have that expectation no matter how many laws you write telling schools that they have to ignore the disadvantages of their children. Well, the reality is that uh, we call uh, schools where we concentrate children like that with these disadvantages, we call them segregated schools and schools are more segregated today than they have been in this country at any time in the last 45 years, more segregated. And the reason they're more segregated is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So I began to think that neighborhood segregation was a, an educational problem. That's how I came to this topic. And then in 2007, I read a Supreme Court decision. Uh, it was called Parents Involved. It concerned um, the school districts of Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington, both of which had implemented a very, very 
insignificant, trivial school desegregation plan where they gave parents uh, the choice of which uh, school in the, the district their child would attend, but if the choice was going to intensify segregation, it wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a parent whose child wouldn't do that. So if you had a, an all white, a mostly white school and the, both a black and a white child applied for the last remaining place in that school, the black child would be given some preference. Trivial, trivial program. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court evaluated it, denounced it. They um, uh, said you couldn't do such a thing. Uh, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the controlling opinion. He said that the schools in Louisville and Seattle were indeed segregated, but he said they're segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. It's a wise observation on the Chief Justice's part. That's why the schools in those communities are segregated. And then he went on to say that the neighborhoods in Louisville and Seattle were segregated de facto for the reasons I described before, not by government, but by private bigotry and actions of private businesses and people's self-choice and income differences. And he said, if you have de facto segregation, something that government was not responsible for creating, then government is prohibited by the constitution from doing anything to uncreate it. Well, I read this decision, as I say, it was a 2007 decision, excuse me. And I remembered reading uh, something some years before about one of those cities, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, in Louisville, there was a, uh, a, a white homeowner in an all white suburb called Shively. Uh, that uh, homeowner uh, had an African-American friend uh, living in the center city of Louisville. Uh, the African-American friend was a decorated Navy veteran, had a wife and a child, uh, uh, wanted to buy a single family home in a suburb like Shively, but nobody would sell him one. So the white homeowner, the single family homeowner in Shively, bought a second home in his community and resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, an angry mob of white residents surrounded the home, protected by the police. They threw rocks through the windows. Police made no effort to stop them. They dynamited and firebombed the home. I have a photograph of this in, in my book, The Color of Law. The police made no effort to stop that. But when this riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence, the white homeowner for sedition, for having sold a home to a black family in a white neighborhood. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police, the criminal justice system, the prosecutors, the courts are all mobilized to enforce racial boundaries in uh, the Louisville area. I began to look into it further and I discovered that uh, there were hundreds and hundreds, I'm not exaggerating in these numbers, hundreds of examples of cases of police protected violence, even police led and organized violence to drive African-Americans out of homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in white neighborhoods. Uh, every one of these police protected, police involved activities was a violation of the constitution, a violation of their 14th amendment responsibilities, civil rights violation that we as American citizens have an obligation to redress, but we've never done so. And then I began to look into it further and I found that there were many, many federal, state and local policies uh, designed to uh, explicitly segregate, segregate the, the races in metropolitan areas. Uh, every one of them was a civil rights violation. Every one of them, because they were public policies of the federal, state, and local governments, um, violated the Constitution. And as American citizens, we have an obligation that we have never accepted to uh, undo this. Well, let me describe one of those policies, a, a powerful one. Uh, there were many, many of them, uh, and I go into many, many policies of federal, state, and local government in, in the book, The Color of Law. I'll describe one of them now to give you an example of how explicit the segregation was that was created by government. Uh, in the post-World War II period, the federal government embarked on a program to move the entire white working class population out of single family homes, I'm sorry, out of apartments, 
in urban areas into single family homes in all white suburbs like that suburb of Shively. This was a racially explicit program to move white families out of urban areas into suburban areas and prohibit African Americans from doing the same. Uh, it was, it intensified the most in the immediate post-World War II period when there were millions of returning war veterans coming home, needing housing. Uh, the um, federal government uh, created these suburbs on an explicitly racial basis. And, and you know these suburbs, uh, they're in every metropolitan area, perhaps not in uh, Scoville, I don't know, but certainly in metropolitan areas, every one of them is uh, ringed with these suburbs uh, that uh, were initially created as all white places. Uh, the most famous of these is probably Levittown, east of New York City. Uh, you, perhaps you're familiar with that. Uh, Levittown was 17,000 homes, uh, but the, there are suburbs like this all over the country and in the Boston metropolitan area and Hartford and uh, New York and Detroit and Chicago and Los Angeles and San Francisco and Kansas City, everywhere, these suburbs were created by the federal government. Levittown, as I say, the largest 17,000 homes in one place, an enormous uh, undertaking. William Levitt, the developer, could never have assembled the capital on his own to buy the land and build these uh, build houses there. Uh, it was not uh, uh, possible, no bank would lend him the money. We were in a suburban country at that time, uh, whites and blacks, uh, working class, middle class families were living in urban areas, not in suburbs. Um, mostly because uh, we were a manufacturing economy and uh, factories had to be located near deep water ports or railroad terminals to get their parts and ship their final products and workers as well as bankers and others uh, who didn't have automobiles uh, uh, had to be able to walk to work and so they all lived broadly in the same neighborhoods uh, but the federal government designed to uh, move all the whites out of those neighborhoods into single family homes in suburbs. Uh, Levitt couldn't get the capital to build this development. No bank would be crazy enough to lend it to him. Uh, we weren't a suburban country, as I said. The banks thought nobody would want to live there. The only way that Levitt could build Levittown or any of these other suburban developers, the only way they could build their developments was by going to the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration, submitting their plans uh, for the development, the architectural design uh, of the houses, the layout of the streets, the um, materials they were going to use, and a federally required commitment never to sell a home to an African-American. It's a federally required commitment. The FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, and the Veterans Administration even required Levitt and many of these other developers to put a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. This is a federal requirement. Wasn't the action of rogue bureaucrats working in these federal agencies? It was written out in a manual of the Federal Housing Administration that was distributed to appraisers all over the country, uh, whose job it was to evaluate the applications of uh, housing developers for federal bank guarantees for the suburbs they wanted to build. The manual said explicitly you could not recommend for a federal bank guarantee a proposal that was going to uh, create a non-segregated community. You couldn't even recommend for a federal bank guarantee a project that would be all white if it was going to be located near where African-Americans were living. Because in the words of the manual, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the federal policy manual said. This notion of de facto segregation, as I say, is utter nonsense. It has no basis in reality to it whatsoever. This country was suburbanized by explicit federal policy. Well, <clears throat> the white families who moved into these homes, they were inexpensive. Um, uh, they had cost at the time all over the country, Levittown and everywhere else, about $8,000 a piece when they were created. In today's money, in today's uh, inflation adjusted currency, it's about $100,000. These were $100,000 homes. Uh, I think uh, you probably all know that you cannot buy these homes for $100,000 today in any metropolitan area of the country, uh, perhaps not even in Scoville. Uh, you, uh, these homes now cost, I don't know, $300,000, dollars $500,000. 
in some parts of the country, a million dollars or more from 100,000 to a million dollars. The white families who bought those homes gained wealth from the equity that they gained from the appreciation and the value of the homes. They used that wealth to send their children to college. They used it to um, uh, finance perhaps temporary emergencies like unemployment or um, uh, maybe medical emergencies. They used it to subsidize their retirements and they used it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren who then had down payments for their own homes. African-Americans were prohibited by explicit federal policy, racial policy, from uh, participating in this wealth generating program. The result is that today, African-American incomes on average are about 60% of white incomes. African-American wealth is about 5% of white wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid 20th century that every one of us as American citizens is an obligation to fix, to undo, to redress is the term we prefer to use. Um, that wealth gap that creates the segregation that we know today is responsible. I, well, I began by talking about the achievement gap in schools. It's responsible for health disparities between African-Americans and whites. African-Americans, as you know, have shorter life expectancies, uh, greater rates of cardiovascular disease because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more dangerous neighborhoods. Uh, the wealth gap and the segregation that it supports contributes to um, mass incarceration of African-Americans and the police abuse that we spent so much time demonstrating about uh, this past spring and summer. Uh, I'm not suggesting that police would never uh, discriminate against uh, African-American and Hispanic men if uh, it were not for segregation, but it's much, much more intense because of segregation when we concentrate the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods without access to good jobs or the transportation to get to those jobs or um, uh, uh, access to, to um, high quality education. When we concentrate those young, it's, it's inevitable that the police are going to engage in confrontations with them. The police are going to assume the stance of an occupying force for a restive native population, the same way that the colonial forces in India or the Congo or anywhere else in, in the 20th century behaved when they were um, faced with controlling a restive disadvantaged population. And the, um, uh, the segregation that we created with this policy also contributes to something else, which is very, very dangerous and frightening. We're very much aware of it these days. And that's the uh, enormous uh, political polarization that we have in this country that largely tracks racial lines. Um, it's not entirely racial, but it largely tracks racial lines. Uh, how can we ever expect to develop the common national identity that we need to preserve this democracy, to create this democracy? if so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other that we have no ability to empathize with each other, no ability to understand each other's life experiences. That's another consequence of the segregation, the unconstitutional segregation that we've created. Well, there were many, many other federal policies, uh, local policies, state policies as well, that created the segregation we know. I, I described many of them in, in The Color of Law let me just say that um, I'm, I'm working on a new book now on what we do about it. And I can tell you that the policies to redress segregation are well known, no mystery about them. Um, housing experts, policy experts, journalists, all know what the policies are to redress segregation. What's missing is not policy ideas. What's missing is a new civil rights movement that's going to be as aggressive, as militant, as determined to redress residential segregation, to make residential segregation uh, uncomfortable for this country, as the civil rights movement of the past was to make the segregation of public accommodations and transportation um, uncomfortable. Uh, I am, uh, let me conclude by saying, uh, I am working with a, a group of uh, national civil rights leaders uh, who are creating something called a national committee to redress racial segregation. 
Uh, they're about to launch it. Uh, its role will not be to throw out policy ideas. As I say, we know what to do. Uh, its role will be to uh, support and create local civil rights groups uh, of concerned citizens, black and white, and other ethnic groups as well, uh, determined to take local action in their communities to redress uh, racial segregation. And hopefully that kind of movement will grow, eventually be able to tackle state uh, level um, policies of segregation and then federal ones. Uh, if any of you uh, in Scoville or who are interested in, in listening to this presentation tonight would like to receive notice of um, the launch of this national committee to redress racial segregation, um, I, I can put you on a list to receive that notice. Uh, maybe I can work out with Lawrence a way of, um, of distributing a, a sign up uh, form uh, to people who have registered for this uh, webinar. Um, with that, I, I'd uh, be glad to spend the last uh, 20 minutes or so in answering your questions if I can or engaging in the discussion with you if you'd prefer. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we've got one question right off the bat. Um, do you think the Black Lives Movement could be that extension of the Civil Rights Movement or the new Civil Rights Movement? Well, certainly uh, it helps to create the conditions for it. Um, we are now having a more accurate and passionate discussion about race and the legacies of slavery and the legacy of Jim Crow in this country than we ever have had before in American history. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is one of 25 million Americans participated in Black Lives Matter demonstrations uh, this summer and spring, this past summer and spring. Uh, most of those 25 million were whites, something completely unheard of uh, at any time in the past in, in any kind of civil rights activity. The, um, but it's not just the, the Black Lives Matter movement. It's, um, well, I, I, I'm not saying this to boast, it's just the fact that my book has had a stunning reception, uh, but it's not just my book. It's not just The Color of Law. It's Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. It's uh, Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy. If you look at the bestseller list, you'll find that a good half of the books on the bestseller list, nonfiction, are about our racial injustice racial inequality, the history of it and how it happened. So, uh, and we have white elected Southern politicians. This is what's amazing to me, white elected Southern politicians running around the South, um, removing statues that commemorate the defenders of slavery, uh, unheard of just a few years ago. So we're having a much more accurate and passionate discussion about race and the Black Lives Matter movement is part of it. But that needs to um, be the basis for the creation of actual organizations in local communities. They're going to tackle the issues of racial segregation. Those 25 million people who participated in those demonstrations in almost all the communities that they have participated, there's no um, continuing organization that's going to address issues of racial uh, inequality. <clears throat> so that's what we need. That's why I'm working with these civil rights leaders to create uh, this new national committee to redress racial segregation, um, to build on that momentum before it's lost that the Black Lives Matter movement uh, uh, created in many places. So um, I'll give you a little, I'm gonna ask the question first and just give you a slight bit of background. So how do you see these policies playing out in more rural areas like the Berkshires? And largely this general area is rural with sprinkled with a few small cities like Pittsfield and Torrington? Well, I, I apologize, but I, I really don't know. Um, my focus, and uh, you knew this when you invited me, uh, was on uh, metropolitan areas. Uh, that's what I know about. That's the history I know about. Uh, that's where segregation is intense uh, throughout the country. And I, I just don't, um, I just don't know uh, about the uh, uh, how, it, how it plays out in rural areas. Fair enough answer. And I like someone to say, I don't know when I don't know. Uh, this is a little bit, well, uh, the affordable housing requirements, I don't know if this is quite a question, but the affordable housing requirements for suburban communities, the dog whistle Trump used in his campaign is surely part of this movement. 
Well, um, unfortunately, there are no affordable housing requirements for suburban communities. Um, you're right, uh, Trump was attacking them. He was attacking something that doesn't exist. Uh, there are no requirements that suburban communities desegregate. There have been in the past. We've moved backwards. Uh, one of the things that I write about in this book, something quite interesting that you may be interested in learning about, uh, in uh, 1970, 69 and 70, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, uh, his name was George Romney, maybe you uh, recognize the name, the father of the present Utah Senator. He um, understood that the federal government had created the segregation that we know today. It was not a mystery, not unknown at that time. You know, the subtitle of my book is A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. It was, it was once well known, it wasn't hidden. And he recognized that the federal government had created the segregation and he said it was the federal government's obligation to undo it. He actually said that the federal government had created a white noose around metropolitan areas and the federal government had to untie that noose. And he uh, began to withhold federal funds from suburb suburbs that didn't take steps to integrate, not just with affordable housing, but with uh, opportunities for middle and working class families to move into those communities. He actually did withhold funds. Uh, this was a Republican Secretary of Housing and Urban Development withhold funds from three suburban communities. Uh, one was uh, near Cleveland, another was uh, Warren, Michigan. The third was Baltimore County outside Baltimore. And um, uh, there was an uproar about the fact that he was actually willing to go to bat to combat segregation. He withheld funds from these communities because they refused to take steps to desegregate. President Nixon, his boss, canceled his program. It was called the Open Communities Program. He canceled it, forced uh, George Romney out of uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and we've had nothing so aggressive since. So um, I wish there were requirements for affordable housing, as well as from middle class and working class housing in many suburban communities where middle and working class families, disproportionately minority, uh, cannot afford housing but we don't have them at present. And uh, without a new civil rights movement, I don't see them as being adopted. This may be another question you can't quite answer, but um, and it is, you see it a lot around here in our small towns. Do you see opposition to affordable housing in towns like ours as another example of the kind of segregation you write about? Oh, yes, because that's not restricted to small towns. That's, that, that's something that's universal in suburban communities. You know, we call them NIMBYs, not in my backyard. Uh, some of the most, the, the places in this country that consider themselves most progressive are the most reactionary when it comes to desegregation. And uh, that's one of the things that the new civil rights movement has to confront. Just as a uh, uh, whites in the South were resistant to um, uh, desegregating uh, restaurants and buses and other public institutions in the 20th century. It's not, uh, this is not an obstacle that can't be overcome. It's one that would be, should be expected. And it's true, not just in uh, areas like yours and small towns, it's true around big cities um, uh, across the country. How do we deal with the resegregation in cities as a result of gentrification? Okay. Well, I want to repeat the policies to redress segregation are well known. What's missing is political will, to, um, uh, which can only be created by a popular movement uh, to support those policies. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with gentrification. Every community should have a mix of uh, market rate moderate working class, low income housing. That would be a democratic community. Uh, what's needed is not uh, preventing gentrification, but preventing the massive displacement of existing residents <clears throat> from communities that are beginning to get some higher priced housing in them. And we know what the policies to do that are. Rent control, limits on condominium conversions, uh, 
requirements for inclusionary housing, meaning that if you have a development, a multi-unit development, some of the units have to be affordable for low-income families. Some have to be affordable for moderate uh, working class families, and some can be at market rate. Uh, those kinds of inclusionary zoning requirements would do a lot to stem massive displacement from gentrification. And we need something else. We need freezes on property taxes for existing homeowners in uh, gentrifying communities. We should do it everywhere um, because there are many, many families, uh, minority, black, and Hispanic families in communities that are gentrifying who've paid off their homes. They own them in full. They don't have mortgages. They own them in full, but they can't afford to live in their own homes because they can no longer afford the property taxes when the neighborhood property values improve. So we should freeze property taxes for existing homeowners and collect the lost property taxes at point of sale. So if uh, you have a homeowner who, um, you know, say bought a home uh, for $50,000 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and um, is, is been paying property taxes uh, under such a program at, at the $50,000 rate for uh, 20 years you know, plus inflation. And uh, then that 50,000 home in the neighborhood, as the neighborhood gentrifies, uh, sells for $400,000. Instead of that, a homeowner making a, a $350,000 capital gain. Uh, the lost taxes at that point are returned to the treasury and the homeowner only makes a fifty thousand, uh, a $300,000 capital gain. Uh, that would be a program that would um, uh, prevent that family from being forced to move because it couldn't pay the property taxes in an appreciating neighborhood. So like I say, the policies are well known, uh, but gentrification is continuing to, to uh, massively displace existing residents because we don't have the political movement to force those policies to be enacted. You mentioned several times that we all have a responsibility to redress the collective history of racism and harm through segregation. Do you have any suggestions for actions that each of us can take as individuals to break down segregation? Not really. I don't, uh, I don't believe that this uh, can be done by individuals. I think the thing that individuals can do is get together with others like-minded uh, people in your community and create a committee that's going to um, uh, take direct action to do this. I'll give you one very simple example that can be done easily by a local committee. Uh, in the book, The Color of Law, I spend some pages uh, analyzing the history textbooks that are used in um, public high schools all across this country. I examined all the most commonly used textbooks. Every one of them lies about this history. They talk about the great work that the federal government did in the post-World War II period to um, suburbanize working class families without ever mentioning that it was for whites only. Um, well, um, the, a local committee that you could form with your neighbors, could examine how this history and uh, the history generally of slavery and Jim Crow is being taught in your schools, not just in February, but throughout the year. Uh, and um, if it's not being taught properly, which it's not in almost every high school in this country, undertake a campaign to have the curriculum reformed. Uh, as part of this uh, new national committee that um, uh, I've been talking about, the National Committee to Redress Racial Segregation, We've created a 17 minute video uh, that uh, for use in high schools to summarize the history that I've been telling you this morning uh, or this evening rather. Uh, we've created a curriculum unit that teachers can use. Both of these are free and a local committee could uh, take action uh, at its local uh, school board or, or a school committee uh, uh, to uh, insist that the history be taught accurately. So that's the sort of thing that I think a um, uh, a local committee could do that doesn't take a great deal of sophistication. Um, uh, I don't think you'd get very far doing this simply as an individual, but if you had an organized committee, you might be able to accomplish it. You've answered parts of this already, but I'll, I'll ask it because it's here. Uh, strikes me that your book makes a strong case for reparations, which is hard to imagine happening in a center-right country that can barely vote Trump out of office. 
Rather than throwing our hands up in despair, can you recommend policies that would both help and have some broader appeal, broader public appeal, whole well, possibly capable of actually being enacted, so forth? Well, as you say, I have answered uh, much of this. Um, yeah, I think uh, reparations, you know, if you, if you um, okay, I'm sorry, let me just say, somebody in the chat said, how can we get access to the 17 minute video and, and lesson plan? Um, I don't know, Lawrence, if you can um, send out this list, uh, uh, send out this um, link uh, to sign up to receive uh, information from the um, National Committee to Redress Racial Segregation. But if, if um, you can, um, uh, if you sign up to receive this information, you'll get this and it's free. Both of those units are, uh, things are free, the curriculum unit and the 17-minute um, uh, uh, um, video. Well, so, um, simplicity sake, why don't you, you get me the link and if people want to email me through the library, it may be a little cumbersome, but at least we know people can get in touch, which is just quickly Scoville Adult Programs at gmail.com or call the library or look on the website. You can figure it out. Okay. Sorry, Richard. That's okay. I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, you know, the question was about reparations. I think most people uh, misunderstand reparations. Uh, they think of reparations as a single monetary payment to the current generation, which as the questioner indicated, um, would never be significant uh, enough to uh, solve the problem that we've created. If um, by reparations, you mean what it should mean, which is to repair the damage that's been done in all the ways it should be done, I, I support that idea. And there are many things we can do short of big monetary payments to begin this process. I've mentioned some of the policies that I think we should um, be pressing to enact. Uh, we should um, uh, uh, be a, a Moving to, uh, I, I mentioned all the policies that we can enact to uh, prevent massive uh, dislocation from gentrification. We should be abolishing zoning ordinances that uh, require everything in a community to uh, be single family homes, frequently are large lot sizes. These zoning ordinances were typically adopted in order to reinforce and perpetuate the segregation of the communities. Those should be changed. These are all aspects of reparations. Some of the things that um, we should do will cost a lot of money. Uh, for example, uh, the federal government should be embarked on an affirmative action program in housing to buy up homes in suburban neighborhoods that are unaffordable now to African-Americans, but who could have, who, which would have been affordable had they been able to uh, purchase them, their families been able to purchase them when whites were moving into them. And the federal government should be buying up homes at market rates and reselling them at the deeply discounted pro, uh, prices to uh, African Americans who can afford to buy homes at modest prices. That would be a narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation. It would be expensive. But many of the things we need to do wouldn't cost anything at all. For example, the policy I just mentioned, prohibiting uh, zoning ordinances that uh, restrict communities only to single family homes on large lot sizes doesn't cost anything to prohibit that kind of segregation. Um, and that should be a considered a form of reparations as well. Thank you, Richard. I apologize to Shirley because I didn't realize she had a question. I don't know if this is your expertise or not, but we'll give it a go. Policies can change unjust laws. What strategies can the heart of white Americans that don't want people of color living next door? Policies can change unjust laws. Oh, that's yeah, she repeated it, okay. That's the question. Well, you know, I don't know. Uh, to, to be truthful and blunt, I'm less interested in what's in people's hearts than what's in their actions. And uh, I'd like to see people um, engage in action to redress segregation. Uh, and um, if people um, in their communities, because they take uh, action that makes it uncomfortable to maintain these policies of, of segregation, if people in their communities only reluctantly agree to them, uh, that's okay, as long as they agree to them. So um, I'm focused more on what we can do to change policies uh, rather than what we can do to change minds because once we change policies, the minds and the hearts will follow. Uh, that's been the history of, of uh, racial progress in this country. 
Uh, you don't see much opposition uh, today to African Americans sitting in restaurants or riding on buses. Uh, people um, accepted that very reluctantly in the 1960s, but they've not only accommodated it to now, but accepted it as a normal and perfectly appropriate uh, part of life. I'm talking about white people. And the same thing will happen when we desegregate neighborhoods. It'll be tough at first, but people will get used to it and they'll like it eventually. They'll realize they have a much healthier neighborhood as a result. Interesting question. Can you comment on the relationship between segregation in real estate areas and the GOP push for redistricting? Is there a way to reverse course? Well, uh, not with the results of the last election. We're going to be fighting with this for some time. Uh, the last, uh, the, the election uh, last month uh, reinforced and in some cases created uh, Republican control of state legislatures, which are going to be in charge of redistricting. And they are going to draw district lines to um, uh, consolidate their power <clears throat> until we um, uh, get a different political environment that's going to continue. I don't have a, a magic solution for that one. Thank well, you. I don't have a magic solution for anything, but I know what to do about racial segregation. All right, I warned, I really, uh, Richard does want to be prompt. I'm going to try one more question, so I'm sorry if a few of you are left out. Let me just see if I can uh, get one here that's particularly good. Uh, would cities who enact inclusionary zoning policies remain attractive to home buyers and developers who have been socialized to live in an economically and racially homogeneous neighborhood? Well, I mean, if we abolish those zoning ordinances, you know, the developers uh, are the first ones to jump at that opportunity to create uh, duplexes and triplexes and garden apartments and uh, condominiums and uh, other less expensive uh, forms of housing than single family homes. I don't think you'll get any opposition from uh, realtors and developers for that kind of policy. I think you get opposition from uh, people in the community who want to maintain a segregated community. And that's why a, a, a popular movement is necessary to combat that. So Richard's told me he's done a few presentations today and it's getting late. So unless you want one more question or not, we're happy to sure. let you go. No, sure. One more question is fine. Let me see if I... Uh, Lars, let me just say this. Uh, I, you know, I, I mentioned before that people sign up for this uh, committee, but if anybody wants the 17-minute the video and the, um, the, uh, um, the curriculum unit uh, right away, I, I'm easily findable. You can send me an email and I'll send it to you. I'll send them both to you. And also, you'll, you'll give me the links, Richard, and people will be emailing me as well. So well, that's, Yeah, that's right. I, you can, you can search. I mean, don't you have a list of people who signed up for this? Yeah, but extracting it is not as easy as you might. It's oh, right. semi-manual. But any case, one way or another, we'll get I'll send it to you. You can circulate it however you can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So actually, I, so I will, if someone wants to ask one question and unmute themselves, one person can do it. Um, I think I've sort of, I think I've covered most of the really pertinent questions. So if someone has something they want to ask, this is your one opportunity. Well, I guess I've done a good job moderating that apparently. Um, and there's many, many thank yous, Richard, on the chat for you. And uh, on behalf of the library and Bridge and the Salisbury Historical Society, and myself, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to engage with you. Great. Thanks so if anyone wants to you know, email, or I'm, obviously you can find Richard through his website, whatever, but go ahead and we'll make sure we get those links out one way or another. Good. I'll get those to you tomorrow. Thank All you. Right. All right. Thank Thanks you, so everyone, much. And, and good night. Okay. Night. Night. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Not Richard. Lawrence. You're welcome. Hi, Sarah Jane. And whoever else said that, whatever they said, <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Great. Well, glad to have all of you. And come back 
Saturday night, Saturday afternoon. <laughs>